Welcome to Higher Ed Live, the live weekly web show all about the world of higher education, where we are all, all about digital development and professional empowerment. If you don't know me, I am Seth O'Dell, your host on this wonderful weekly ride that we take each and every Sunday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, like most weeks, I am not alone. So let me go right ahead and invite our very nice guest onto the show tonight. So please, a round of digital applause as I welcome Colleen Brennanberry, Web Communications Manager at Monroe Community College in a city I love, Rochester, New York. Colleen, how's it going? It's going great, Seth. Thanks for having me on. And uh, Rochester loves you too. You need to come visit. I definitely, <laughs> I'm going to be in Rochester, I predict, sometime this summer. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to find a way. Uh, so if you live near the area, maybe we'll all have a meetup uh, just with, with me and Colleen hang out. Um, so we are not here today just to chit chat, although that is fun. We are here to talk about crisis communications in higher education. And uh, this is a big topic. We're going to cover a lot. We're going to talk about technology, the web, fundamentals, what you need to do, and uh, anything else in between. So guys, you know the rules, but get it out there. Questions or comments, Higher Ed Live is the hashtag. We're going to be relying on you guys to direct part of the show today. we got a lot to talk about, but we want to hear what you have to say too. So that's what we're here to do. But first, we got to say a quick thank you as always to our sponsors. So let me say thank you to Integral. Higher Ed Live is sponsored by Integral, the creators of the Schools app on Facebook. Be sure to check out their webinar series about how they can help you leverage Facebook to increase yield and retention. That happens this Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And you know what? I'm sending out a tweet to the, with a link to that right now in case you guys are interested. But they're not the only sponsors. A big thank you also goes out to Omni Update, the leading web content management system CMS provider for higher education. The company's web CMS OU campus is secure and scalable with great tools and features, deployment flexibility, and an awesome user community. In fact, it was the highest ranked CMS in customer satisfaction in a 2010 EDU Guru survey. So if you need a CMS, check out the link that I'm gonna be tweeting out right about now. We're getting that link out there. Sorry, guys. Working on a couple of bugs. It's out there. So those are our sponsors. A big thank you to them. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and get a couple quick news updates for you guys, uh, maybe that you haven't quite seen before. So first off, guys, you should know next week, Google Analytics. What's new with it? With the one and only Seth Miranda. We are talking about the latest edition of Google Analytics. What's new? What you need to know? It's going to be a great show. But that's not the only thing going on. Sunday, July 24th, mark your calendars. I am live in Albany, New York at Reed, should say Reed Media Headquarters. Oops, it doesn't, but it should. Reed Media Headquarters with Rachel Rubin, uh, the one and only, talking rebranding and higher ed. And finally, one more to mark your calendars for. Wednesday, July 27th, a special higher ed live, going to you live from the Staymates Integrated Marketing Conference with a special called Teens Talk. They have an annual event where they bring in college-bound high school students to talk directly with college marketers about what does and doesn't work. And I'm going to be there in person live streaming that for you guys. So that's a lot of information to keep up on. But please mark your calendars and stay tuned with higheredlive.com for all that information because we have a busy, busy summer. Okay, so let's go right into it, guys. We start each every week with something that I like to call the weekly five. Five stories from around the world of higher education that are worth reading and noting and taking care of. First one, guys, is the story going on of the week, really. Google Plus. Obviously, Google released Google Plus. It's their new, not quite a social network, but it's pretty much everything else in between, and uh, it's out there. So my question to you guys right now, I'm going to ask Colleen and Sugi, what do we think, is, it, is this a big deal for higher education? Um, I Obviously, people have jumped on the buzz and the wave bandwagon. I, I would say this looks like a lot bigger, but I'm still on the fence if we need to be worrying too much about Google Plus right now, besides for our own personal use at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting product. I think that... I will be very interested to see where they take it. Um, right now, you know, I think that if you can find a social media platform that integrates many of the different platforms that we're on, if you can bring in the Facebook feed and the Twitter feed and have a central feed for yourself somehow, that certainly kind of makes it more of a holy grail. Um, we'll see if actually Google Plus is able to do that. Um, and if that then has value, particularly for our students, um, they're so lovely and fickle about what they will and will not use. Um, and I think it's hard to make, you know, to make anyone adjust from what they're already used to. So there's got to be something killer there that makes someone move. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really good point. I think, you know, 
it's interesting to follow again guys I'd love to hear what your thoughts are I mean I like Google Plus I think it's cool but I'm not really worrying about it right now I don't think it needs to work get into the workflow you know it's specifically not meant to be used by marketers or companies right now Google has said hold off if you are a company or a business so um, I'm putting it on the on the wait list personally uh, follow it use it for fun I love love the hangouts feature that's really cool it's way better than tiny chat way way more stable um, but uh, I don't know I'm really excited to see how it plays out this summer the one thing I want to say about it where I think Google Plus has real possible leverages in schools that are adopting Google apps for education and schools that are using Gmail exclusively for email for their institution. Because what that means is if you're using Google to support your email as an institution, arguably every student coming in is already able to use Google Plus. And you could, you could utilize that in the classroom a lot easier if it's not an opt-in issue if students already have access. So, um, you know, that's it. And, and I think I'm, I'm with Patrick Powers here who says Google Plus will only be big in higher education if, if only because Google's behind it. Yeah, that's a good point. If anything Google's behind, you got to follow and you got to keep an eye on. So um, I think it's interesting. I, I, I appreciate all your thoughts coming in. Uh, I, I really do. And you know, Mark's calling it a big deal. Um, so I think that means it's worth following. So keep an eye on that, guys. That's the one. Uh, next one going out this week. You probably already saw this, but I finally wrote that post why I was wrong about QR codes. And man, that kind of blew up a little bit. Not everybody agreed, which I love, though. That's good. Um, but I put a post out saying why I think I kind of thought a little shallow about QR codes. I hadn't thought it all the way through that I thought of them as a, as a way to direct people to a link, but really it's much more, and I demo that. So if you didn't see that article yet, you know, please check it out. And the reason I wanted to mention it now is because uh, thanks to a comment on that article, I discovered a great site called QR Stuff. Dot com. Has anybody ever seen this site before? It's really cool. It's a way to build QR codes way beyond just what Bitly does where it does it for a link. It's an ability to build it that does things so you can like instantly load your contact information into a phone or text somebody, kind of go that next step. And I thought that was pretty cool. So um, definitely check out QRStuff.com if you're interested in QR codes. Uh, next up on the weekly five, Quick Starter. Have you guys seen this? This just launched this week. It's a, a page, essentially a whole website, book built out by Constant Contact. I know not everyone's favorite, um, but it's an amazing site and resource for social media marketing. It's got, I mean, loads and loads of case studies and videos. This is the kind of site you need when your boss tells you, why do we need to do that? Because you can send a link to an awesome site with tons of videos and information. I'm just saying, guys, you're going to want to bookmark this site. I was really impressed at the depth uh, so far of Quick Starter. So, Check out Quick Starter when you get a chance. Um, but that's not it for the Weekly Five, because you know what? We got five of them each and every week. So the next one is a great read, which is an article on how increasing online donations can actually hurt donor engagement. Um, I was really su surprised by this, but what the article raises the point is, um, is essentially saying that just giving money online isn't donor relations. And if you and people give money online because it's easy. But if you think simply give it, having them give to you and taking their email address and building a big database is engagement, it's not. There's a deeper level to online engagement. So I, I give the article credit for really hammering home on something that's a positive, which is online donations and the ease of allowing your alumni, your, your community, and your stakeholders to donate to you, but also holding yourself to a higher level and saying that's not enough engagement for me. I don't just want them to click and put a credit card information in. I want to actually engage and share with them. So definitely worth the read, guys. I, I was impressed with that article. And uh, finally, for the weekly five, you, University of Iowa is offering a $37,000 MBA scholarship that you have to apply to via tweet. That's right. You, you have to tweet out why you should get $37,000, and then they'll give it to the winner. I don't know what I think about this. Um, I love technology as much as the next one. I think it's a really creative challenge. But when you're talking about scholarships and uh, making education accessible is the best way to give out a scholarship 140 characters. I don't know guys, am I missing the boat here? I saw this and I was a little weirded out, but maybe not. I mean, other people online, they think it's cool, but I don't know, $37,000 tweet, that's the question of the week. I'll look to you guys to answer. And uh, each and every week we have something called the unsolicited shout out of the week, where I shout out a person, place, thing or idea because I can, it's my show, and what I'm shouting out is awesome. This week is no exception. I'm shouting out WhereDidMikeGo.com. This is a website from Mike Richson, who's a, a gentleman I met last year at Simtech, Staymates uh, Marketing Conference in Vegas, and he's just a really great guy. And I got to tell you, he, um, he quit his job, and he's biking around the country telling stories. And it's the coolest, most inspirational thing ever. Um, it's pretty drastic, pretty dramatic, but he's living his life. He's doing something. So... I really, guys, suggest if you were looking for some inspiration, a good story this weekend to get you fired up for Monday, check out WhereDidMikeGo.com and just, you know, get excited. It's a cool story. And, um, to, and to Mike, wherever he is, I think he's out in Oregon somewhere today. 
Um, you know, congratulations, man. I'm proud of you for going out and really chasing something. I think that's really, really cool. So that brings us to today's topic, crisis communications in higher education. Uh, and this is a loaded topic. So right off the bat, I'm going to bring on today's guest. Uh, and Colleen, let, let's, let's set the stage a little bit. Like what kind of crisis are we going to be talking about today so people understand kind of, you know, what kind of context we're putting to this conversation? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the key question, right? I mean, I think that one of the first things I always recommend people when you are working on crisis communication strategy is define for yourself how you and your institution are going to say, you know, this is a crisis. Here's what constitutes a crisis for us. Um, I think traditionally, the crisis is a natural disaster, an emergency, um, something where there's health and safety ramifications for our community. Um, but I think that there are many other types of crises that have emerged for us as institutions, um, whether those are maybe less kind of health and safety issues, maybe it's a power outage, which has its own ramifications, um, but certainly can be a crisis for us. And Frankly, it can be something that happens online because a crisis can not just jeopardize health and safety. Frankly, it can jeopardize an institution's standing, reputation, um, and basically its brand. And I think that can be just as much of a crisis in some ways. Yeah, I, I absolutely. I can't agree more. Um, and it's a great context for us to kind of start with this conversation. But guys, if you're watching and you want us to talk about something specific, let us know. I'm sure you've all been through something on your campus, and we're going to talk about it. These things are not cookie cutter, so we're going to stick in the wide realm of natural disaster, emergency crime, but we're gonna dive into everything else too. So um, just to start telling you, you have been through some recent crisis issues on campus yourself. Um, why don't you shed a little light on that as we get into this topic, because I'm sure you'll probably be referencing it throughout the show, and this way folks have a little bit of understanding on uh, what you've been through uh, somewhat recently. Sure, um, and ours actually uh, is kind of an interesting multi-layered scenario. So, and I think it starts where a lot of us had a recent crisis, which was on February 2nd, um, something that everybody loved to call a snowpocalypse or snowmageddon um, hit the U.S. and kind of swept across and uh, feet and feet of snow and um, huge, huge weather issues um, and campuses were closing left and right. Um, so the first wave of that for us was that... Um, the crisis first erupted on February 2nd when we started to get ahead of the storm, um, our community saying online, particularly, why don't you ever close? Why don't you ever close? Why aren't we closed yet? Um, that continued until the next day um, when we only got like four inches of snow, which in Rochester is, you know, a random weekday. Um, so it, the kind of the call continued and it became kind of an online crisis, which was then compounded the third day, um, because then I did get a call in the morning saying our power is out. Um, our entire campus went down. And interestingly, we had three redundant systems backing up our email, our website, and all of that went down. Mm -hmm. So we literally had um, to close all of our campuses and locations, and we had very limited tools to do so. Um, so it kind of compounded upon itself. We were still dealing from the fallout of why don't you ever close so that when we did have to close, um, it was a, a really interesting issue to have to deal with. Yeah, that is that does sound interesting. And that's, that's bringing in one of the topics we're going to talk about a lot today is, is you know the use of social media. And, and this is a place where people are going to be really vocal sometimes calling for stuff. And, and it's it can get out of hand pretty quickly. Um, so that does sound a little bit stressful. I agree, three inches of snow in Rochester is not that bad. Um, but it does sound like the response can be a little bit stressful. So let's dive right in, guys. Uh, when we're talking about crisis communications, I think the best place to start outside of preparing, which we're going to get all into, is, is first response when a crisis happens. Um, is, you know, what do you do immediately when something happens? And I think you know, the first thing to understand is you got to always be monitoring so you're ready. And what does that mean depends entirely on the context of the crisis. If you're talking about a natural disaster, um, you know, you're really talking about, okay, how can we you know, be prepared, for instance, if we think it's going to snow a lot, if there's going to be storms, knowing ahead of time, always being on top of potential crisis situations and being able to identify that. And the other one is you know, sometimes as simple as having a very strong relationship with your campus police. Because if this is an unfortunate crime on campus or an incident where it's a crisis uh, you know, of a criminal activity on your campus, you're going to likely hear about it first from your campus police or campus security, depending on the setup that you have. And that's usually going to be where you hear about it first. So monitoring is really important. But, you know, so is also having all your ducks in a row and having a plan in place ready to go so you can essentially, you know, instantly jump into action right away. So, so Colleen, if you can, just talk a little bit about that, about having, you know, a plan together and, you know, the tools are the tools that you use, but also the process and having it all streamlined beforehand. You know, how important is having the strategy in place before you need it at all? 
Oh, I mean, strategy to me at least, um, and this is one of the things we've kind of discovered going through this process, um, is strategy is everything. Doing your homework ahead of time um, is absolutely your number one tool. Strategy and preparation is your number one tool. Technology is awesome, um, and it does tons of things for you. But in the end, to me, tools are in some ways the least of the issue because if you aren't ready to use the tools, uh, they are no good to you. Um, so it's really important to spend time ahead of time, like you said, Seth, you know, monitor, have a plan for monitoring, know who should be involved in that first alert scenario, um, and not only know your campus police, but I would also say, you know, know the other people involved in general in your process, whether that's vice presidents, whether that's your IT folk, whether that's your facilities people, um, or your kind of your key stakeholders, get to know them too, because they're the people who are going to be on the ground working with the situation, um, and they're going to be able to help keep things updated and, and know what's happening as well. Um, so I think that getting all of that into place is really part of your homework, all of our homework, um, and that's the number one thing we have to do to be ready. Absolutely. Absolutely could not agree with that more. And I just want to mention one thing when we talk about, you know, getting everything together and being prepared ahead of time. This is one thing that I don't think all folks uh, have thought about yet, but we need to prepare about the for the loss of communication platforms, specifically for cell phones. Uh, so many institutions are providing cell phones now to staff members on campus. Most of the time it's all within one, one institution. But if you have a crisis that happens, you could lose the ability to actually utilize those very quickly. In my own personal experience, we did have an earthquake a couple years ago, and AT&T service was lost. And that was the, that's the cell provider for all of campus. So that right there is a major red flag. That While you're prepared, are you also prepared that what happens when no one's cell phones work? You know, what happens when no one's emails work? How are you going to reach them? So it's, it's, it's kind of having those potential situations and brainstorming them and thinking, if this happens, then what? And kind of making sure, I guess, people are... There's plans in place, you know, all the way down the line, if this, then what? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, with the scenario that we had in February, we lost our power. Um, so that was a larger citywide issue. Um, so that was A. And then we had a, a co we have a cogeneration electrical plant on campus that's supposed to kick in uh, if there's an issue with, with power. That failed. Um, and then there's a, a basic kind of generator hookup that keeps just vital systems in place until we can get a solution. That failed. Um, so we lost email, we lost website, we did not have redundant backups, we didn't have mirrored issues, um, and so we really, truly, you know, kind of found ourselves at a bit of a loss. Um, thankfully, we've resolved that sense, but it was a hard lesson. So yeah, definitely try to think about, okay, if you lose this, what happens? Or even down to a physical level. Um, if you're on campus, where does everybody congregate? Does everyone know where to go if there's a, a place to to kind of run the communication stream for? Or if you're not on campus and campus isn't isn't accessible, um, do you all know to go to the bagel bin down at 12 Corners? Or do you have to find, a, you know, do you all kind of scatter and just hope you can find one another? Um, so sometimes you have to just be very practical in, in what you do. It's not just about the message, but sometimes it's really about that plan too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it really is having that in place as best you can. Now we have a couple questions that already came in that I just want to tackle because these are about the big strategy. You know, uh, Patrick Powers asks, what's the best way to share a plan internally? Um, I will say that, you know, generally speaking, you know, hundreds of institutions have their crisis communications plan currently posted online. I've been through, uh, I was telling I read about a hundred of them, well, not read, I'd say glanced at a hundred of them <laughs> uh, about over the last couple of days. Most people have them posted as PDF files. Um, but a lot of schools also had into things like emergency cards that you could print out and stick in your wallet. Um, I mean, my thought is the best way to do it internally is to do whatever you can, which is to communicate it often, have it in a, in a common shared place, one website where people are going to see it. Um, and then I do like the idea of having like whether it's a wallet card or, or maybe a mobile site so people are out. Any other way you can make sure people have access to that information at any time. Uh, the next question too was, was um, from, from George, was how do you keep a communications plan from falling apart. So Colleen, I'm going to throw this one to you. I'm curious. This is a good point. You know, planning is great, but how do you make sure people actually stick to a plan? Um, you know, when, when things go down, you know, that they don't just kind of act entirely on their own. Okay, that's human nature. Um, and that's a tough one. Yeah, that's in a crisis. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that it has to do with 
first of all, making sure the right stakeholders are involved um, and making sure that everyone does know the plan, first of all. Um, I think having drills sometimes helps that so people are familiar with the process they're supposed mm -hmm. to carry out, that, that the first time they don't, you know, the first time they enact a system isn't in an actual emergency, that they've had tabletops or you've had continued meetings, and those should be fairly regular, not necessarily every week, but at least maybe every quarter or every semester. Um, try to get that team together so you can run through those scenarios. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is a plan is great and it is key. And I think it is your number one tool, but it also has to be somewhat flexible because quite frankly, um, the day everything breaks down is the day that your vice president who is in charge of IT and is directing that part of the team is in Hawaii on vacation or um, can't get to their cell phone or something else happens and things do break down. So I think that there does have to be a little bit of flexibility there. Um, understanding that scenarios probably will never be exactly the way you think they're going to be. Um, you can hypothesize as much as you want, um, but I think it does in the end just come down to knowledge, good, strong teamwork, and building that team so that if there is a breakdown, you can call somebody and say, okay, look, this doesn't seem to be working. We need to reconfigure this fast. Here's how we're going to go about it. Um, I think that's really important. It's, it's Part of it's just that we're humans, and there has to be really good relationship there. Absolutely, and I love the point you made too, but you know, the, the first time you're going through one of these plans shouldn't be in the emergency. Drill, have practice, you know, drills and put and put the stuff, you know, to test. Um, you know, we've done that before. We've had all sorts of tests on campus and I think you need to because that's how you identify where the bugs are and where the problems are. Um, and I think that's that's really important to do that. Um, now let's walk through the very beginning stage of a crisis. Uh, so something happens on campus, whether it is active shooter or natural disaster or something serious. I mean, the first thing, the first challenge you have after gathering your initial information, most likely from the police, um, is immediately how do you deliver the very first message to people? How do you get the first information that there is an active shooter on campus or there has been an earthquake or something like that? How do you get that out to people immediately? Um, and there's a few ways to do that that, that we're going to talk through. The first one is text messaging, um, which is, I, I think Colleen, Colleen you'll agree, it's been pretty much at this point common. Uh, I mean, I think a few years ago, folks, it was still a question of do we need an emergency text message system in place? But it seemed after Virginia Tech that everybody has moved that way. There's a ton of vendors that offer this. Um, is Dialogic Communications does UMass and Boston, UMass Boston Alerts. There's Campus Alerts, Club Texting, Mobile Campus, Omni Alert. There's a lot of different companies that provide this. And it's the same thing you see a lot. There's an emergency. You can send out a mass text message to all of your students uh, that hits all their phones at the same time. So, I mean, is it safe to say, Colleen, at this stage that, that having a text solution is a must? Oh, I think so. I mean, you know, as far back as, you know, 2008, 2009, Educause ran a big study um, looking at campuses and SMS or texting was definitely one of the number one ways that students said they wanted to be contacted in an emergency. I think it's not just a, a most campuses have it. I think it's an expectation um, because that message can then get to people, your whole community, wherever they are. Um, and I think, too, with a lot of these tools, um, people are moving to not just to a, a tool that can text, but to multi-platform tools that from one interface you can do things like text, email, um, and hit other kind of channels simultaneously, update your website, et cetera, because speed is of the essence. Absolutely. No, speaking of speed, great questions coming in um, from, from Jason Wood was saying, is texting uh, fast enough these days for crisis communications? And I can tell you the good news is, yes, actually it is. Uh, and the example I'll share is Missouri University of Science and Technology. Uh, mostly we know Andrew Cariego, who is uh, you know, a good friend of a lot of us online. He was through a situation where they had a, an, a campus shooter uh, and an, a possible campus shooter. And within six minutes of the first call to police, the, the text message was already delivered to campus on phones. So you're talking about a six-minute delay of the police call you and you say, okay, we need to send out a text message, and the phone actually going off with the text message delivered. Six minutes. So to me... I would say, yes, texting is fast enough. Um, but then again, I will say, I don't know specifically what vendor they use, and that's a question that I'm sure you would want to test out a lot. I know at UCLA they do a lot of tests of the Bruin Alert system because of that exact reason is, are they hitting all the same people at the same time, or are they pulling in you know one group of person over another? So I think in general the answer is yes, but um, it, it's up for, up for uh, argument. So if texting is, is automatic and uh, it has to be used, uh, then also I think the other one that's really common is email, right? I mean, Colleen, that's one thing where at this point, too, it's the same thing. You, uh, the sending out the mass email to all of campus is pretty much tied right into sending out the mass text message at this point. 
Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I think that we have to do email. I think we have to hit a multitude of channels because, quite frankly, I think that where our community is, they could be one of five different communication points at any given moment. I think texting is a great way to reach them directly and quickly. Um, but I think that, you know, we tell students, at least I know at my campus, that email is one of the or is the official channel for the college's communications. Um, so I think we can't neglect that. We have to use that as an official channel if we've asked our students, told our students to expect that, then we have to fulfill that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you brought the point too that that's, I think, the same point everyone online who's, it's about multi-channel uh, you know, emergency communications. It's about reaching out in multiple ways because some people might not have their phone on them or they might not have cell service. They might have access to email. They might not. It's, a, I think, I mean, we got to take a step back and say, what's our responsibility? Our responsibility is safety. And the first step is giving people information to keep themselves safe. If there is a crisis on campus, we do not have the ability to physically keep all the people on campus safe. We, we don't, not if the police aren't there yet, if someone hasn't been apprehended, or if there's been an, an emergency and people are being treated, but we have the ability in theory and we have the obligation to attempt to communicate all the readily available information possible so people can make the most educated decisions to keep themselves safe in these situations. And that is why I think multi-channel has to make sense because you have to reach people any way you can. Uh, but this, you brought the other thing about emails is it is also too about not just what's in the emails, but directing people to the, the best place to go for information. And I think it brings us to, to the website, to the homepage. Um, and, and this is something we saw too, again, this happened in Virginia Tech, it's happened more that people have plans in place to essentially take over a homepage in, in a situation that is an emergency. Um, and that's something I think that's really important is, is twofold. One is being able to take over the homepage. So that means removing videos, removing flash, putting simply a text-based only site that can handle a lot of traffic um, so the site doesn't go down. And then the other thing is also just having a centralized place. So everyone knows this is where I go. This is where the most up-to-date information is going to be posted moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I personally really love uh, kind of the the light homepage model, or some people call it a dark homepage that you kind of have hidden in the shadows that um, as soon as something happens that's significant, you move it into place. And I'm a big fan of the blog format. I know a lot of people have talked about and have started kind of thinking through using Posturus or other tools similarly um, to kind of replace your homepage with almost something that looks like a blog so that um, as updates come in, they're time and date stamped. Um, it's the most recent at the top and then obviously chronologically down towards the bottom. But it also gives a really nice record and archive so that people who are coming to your website at any point during the communication stream can see the whole communication stream um, and don't necessarily have to kind of go, okay, well, what came before this or how did we get to this point? Um, so I'm a big fan of that kind of, and I know that, again, Missouri S&T um, really flipped theirs into place very quickly, and that was a great example of a blog-based homepage uh, kind of overtake that I think really worked very nicely. Absolutely. I agree. That was actually less than 10 minutes from that call that there was an active shooter. Six minutes in, they had a text out, and 10 minutes in, they had the homepage with a total takeover. I think that is a great example, and it is about speed. You know, Again, because if it's about getting people information as quickly as possible to keep them safe, then that's just a really great example of doing that. Uh, but you know, it's going to depend on your plan. I really do think the blog idea is interesting. I have seen people talk about posters before as well. So when it comes to websites, I hear you. whatever you do, you have to have a plan to take the homepage over and you have to know that the homepage is going to be where people go for at least links to the most up-to-date information. Um, you know, one other thing to note when we're talking about, now we've talked about texting, we've talked about email, we've talked about websites. One thing to note too is digital signage. We've talked about digital signage uh, somewhat recently on Higher Ed Live and we talked about it more from a marketing perspective, but I think it is important to note that there are vendor solutions out there that can set up where they can overtake all signage on campus instantly, even if there's different hardware, so different TVs, different softwares. It's a software that lies on top of everything else, and you can essentially flip a switch and all TVs will convert to a message. So I think that's an interesting approach that people will go by and see a sign like this and, and know about it. I, I think, again, it goes to the, the, the thing, though. It, this is about having multi-channel approach to reach as many people as possible, whether they have their phone on them, they're at a computer, they're walking around campus. You know, some campuses also have actual um, loudspeakers that you can announce on campus. Um, it's the same thing. It's, it's using as much as possible, as many channels as possible. So that's why I just want to put digital signage in there, too. Um, but, Colleen, the big one thing that we're going to talk about now is probably going to bring the most uh, questions and comments coming, which is the role of social media. Um, you know, I'm just curious from your perspective, just starting out before, as we dive into all this, you know, what, what do you think the role of social media should be in that, at least in that initial announcement first, um, when there's a crisis, should we even be telling people about it, you know, via Twitter or Facebook? Oh gosh, yes. Um, I'm a big social media proponent, right? So, um, you know, 
I think that we absolutely should view social media as one of our primary channels for crisis communication. I think that particularly um, know what the biggest platforms are for your institution. And I think across the board for probably the vast majority, if not all of us, it's going to be Facebook and Twitter. Um, in my experience, Facebook is a great place to reach students, alumni, and parents, um, and current community. Um, including our staff and faculty. Twitter for us has been more um, of a way to reach media um, and more of a place where we interact with media in a crisis. Um, but I think absolutely that um, that is one of the places where students and everyone else goes for information about our institution. And it also allows us to push information to them again, not just make them go to the website, um, but also allows us to push into their news stream someplace where they're going to be getting their information anyway um, and get that to them. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and now, so why do you think it is that it's still so far off from being accepted in crisis communications? I mean, one of the things I found so interesting is uh, that I looked through literally probably upwards of 100 different crisis communications plans from colleges and universities, and few, very few, I'm talking less than 10, even mentioned social media at all. Um, and that really surprised me that I, I'm going to go ahead and say it. If social media is not in your crisis communications plan, your crisis communications plan is not good. It needs to be there. If you're just going to leave it up to whoever wants to post whatever they want to post, I think that's a real problem. So I think it needs to be addressed. It's clearly being used in crisis anyway. So I don't know, Colleen, why do you think it is that, that, that so few institutions have still put anything about social media in their, in their uh, you know, crisis communications plans at all at this stage? Well, let me answer it with another question. How many institutions actually include social media in their strategic overall communications plans? The fact of the matter is probably not even 100% of our institutions, probably not even 60 or 70% of our institutions focus on social media as a primary strategic communication tool. Um, if we can't even necessarily get institutions to that point, then it's a harder sell for us to say, in a crisis too, this is going to have value. That doesn't mean it doesn't have value. I think we all know it does, um, but I think it makes it a harder sell for us. And I think, unfortunately, until your institution experiences a crisis through the lens of social media and sees what can happen and how it can be used, um, it's a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, I agree. And I, that's a good point. I think it is, it may just be that, that we haven't embraced it as a whole yet in a lot of our strategic plans. But um, one of the things I found interesting was, you know, University of Texas at Austin uh, had an active shooter situation. I'd like to say it was maybe last October or September. I remember following it. And they did a great job of using social media to direct information. And yet when I went and read their, their strategic plan, it doesn't include it at all. So whoever was doing that for University of Texas at Austin did a great job but they weren't actually part of the crisis communications plan as a whole. And I think that's a little bit concerning. Um, and I think we definitely got to work on getting that in there whenever possible. Um, you know, so what, what should we use social media for in a crisis? I mean, the first simple thing to say is, I mean, I would say it's to direct people to information. It's not about providing the information like, you know, long fold on Facebook or Twitter, but it is about continuing to send the links and promote funneling everyone to the same place, wherever that information is and letting them know. Um, and would you agree? I think, I mean, when we're talking about social media, for me, really, it is entirely about Twitter and Facebook. Those are the two real-time platforms that I see as powerful that people are already using in a crisis. Whether or not we as an institution are using it, every crisis that I see in higher ed is, is going viral in their own area. People, students are using it. Um, but for me, it's pretty much Facebook and Twitter. I don't see the same thing as people aren't generally posting YouTubes instantly. It's not the same to me. So, I mean, Colleen, would you agree with that? Do you think this is really a Facebook and Twitter conversation uh, when it comes to crisis and social media? Yeah, I think for, for the vast majority, if not all of us, that is where our people are. That's where our community is. Um, and like I said, I think with Facebook, the power of it, um, like you said, Seth, is A, to direct people to more robust information, but to that website or to wherever you're kind of sharing that information, but also, frankly, to answer questions. Facebook, right? Social media is the conversation. Everybody's got questions. This is your opportunity to answer a lot of those questions as they come in, um, to stem misperception, to actually be able to give the message in your own words, um, and to answer any kind of outstanding questions. Um, and then again, for us, for, for with Twitter in particular, um, in crisis, that is where we hear and discuss things with the media. We're finding that news media and news outlets are no longer in a crisis calling our PIO. Instead, they are tweeting to us, asking us questions, um, tracking information, retweeting what we're putting out there. Um, 
you know, basically right from Twitter as opposed to being in direct contact with a, our chief communication officer. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, I think one of the big things too is to talk about is, is you know, is attacking rumors. Like the whole thing with social media, people always say is you can't, you know, you no longer own the conversation. Um, that's very true, but you own your right to discredit rumors. And I think that's really important in a crisis to be able to be a credible voice. And people aren't going to view you as a credible voice if your Twitter account is sitting there silent. And if your Facebook page is sitting there not updating, then when rumors go around and students are posting their own information, that is going to be looked at as the credible voice. And while you are not the only credible voice in a crisis, I think it's important to own your opportunity to be that for your institution. I think the only way you can do that is by engaging. And, and one thing I'll say too, before we move on from this point, is just that uh, no comment is still a comment. Uh, so many times I've seen things where people say, you can't say anything, you can't talk about it. But if you can just say, you know, we're hearing you guys, we are working on a response, we're going to be posting something online in an hour, or, you know, go to this website for more information, when we have it, it will be posted. There are things that you can do. So just know that no comment is still a comment. You can say we don't have information and say something rather than literally being silent. I think that's a real mistake for a lot of folks when they fall silent entirely. Um, so respond to questions, even if you don't have the answer. Um, yeah, I think that's absolutely huge. Um, I, you know, I will tell you that when we had our issue not too long ago, I literally sat in front of my computer. I did not take a break for about four hours. I just sat there, and it was a constant back and forth with people answering questions, allaying fears, um, thanking people, getting thanked in return, actually, which was amazing for being responsive. Um, and I think that there are two things I would say when you're responding in a crisis via social media. Um, from kind of a communications point of view, I would say, first of all, you know, we hear a lot about making sure you're sharing your brand message all the time in all ways. And I would say, yes, that's important. But in the evolution of a crisis, in the moment of a crisis on social media, worry less about your brand message and more about fulfilling your brand promise. In other words, I mean, that's your job at that moment in time. Don't worry about kind of talking about how wonderful your school is. Instead, like you said, you're there to keep them safe and healthy um, and really show the quality of the institution by what you do and how you respond. Um, and the, the pieces that we use to drive that, we always say be ready, be rapid, be responsive, and be real. Again, this is not the time for marketing talk. Um, it's the time for being there and being a real human in a real situation, um, talking to other people who have real concerns. And I think those are really important things. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, you know, one more point as we're talking about social media. I just want to say I tweeted out a link. I thought Duke's uh, crisis communications plan was pretty good comparatively to a lot of the other ones that we saw. But I have to give a very interesting shout out to one institution that had a very interesting approach, and that's Case Western Reserve University. Uh, and they, what they did is they actually have – uh, this is something that's in their plan, which I agree word for word, quote, it's essential that all Case Western Reserve University related social media accounts communicate uniform messaging during a crisis. And I say this because your social media accounts across campus are going to go rogue. Someone is going to and they're going to say something. And I understand you can't have one centralized voice, but you need to sh not allow folks all over campus, people in the math department, Facebook group, and other areas to be able to be putting in information because the media will quote them as your institution. All I can say is take my word at that. That has happened and will happen again, that if someone puts up an update on some random Twitter account that's for one area of your school, doesn't matter if it's an athletics Twitter account, they're going to quote it in the media as your institution saying that. So the question is, can we actually own that at all? Well, again, I have to say, let me tell you what Case Western Reserve University has actually done. Uh, they have put together a plan, and it says that you cannot, this is, hear me out, this is really interesting, you cannot have a Twitter or Facebook account on campus, period, at all, unless you turn over the password to the crisis communications team. And then, in a crisis, no one is allowed to use social media except for their crisis team. So what their crisis team can do is instantly control every single social media presence on all of campus. That's really interesting. I really want to know what your thoughts are on that, guys, because I found that really interesting, that they can instantly take over all social media and talk about it. And on top of that, there are things like hellotext.com, uh, hellotxt.com, where you can instantly update to all Facebook group pages at once. So in theory, you could take over your campus, every Facebook page, all you know, 200 you might have your institution, hit one status update, and it sends out to every page that there's a crisis on campus, go to the homepage for more information. That will be the reliable source. That's pretty crazy. I don't know, Colleen, I don't know what you think about that. I, I was shocked that, I don't know how they pulled it off, first off, but I thought that was a really interesting approach for crisis communications. 
I find it fascinating, actually, and I'm dying to talk to them now because I really want to know how they do that and how many pages that affects. And and I would love to talk to them more. So Case Western Reserve folks, if you're out there, feel free to chime in, um, yeah. please. Um, you know, I think there's part of me who's kind of that social media person who's like, oh, God, OK, I don't know how I feel about that. That's a place for authentic conversation. I want people to feel free to do that. Um, I don't want to kind of be involved and monitor their status or, you know, take over their page. Um, but the other part of me that is kind of the, again, that safety person, I feel like our responsibility is to keep people safe. Um, if in an emergency, and again, I think it goes back to institutionally defining a crisis and then sharing that definition so that people understand when things would happen and it would be taken over or not, or messages would be pushed out or not. I could see the value of that. I can see the value of being able to push a button and say, there's an active shooter, get down. Um, because I think that the risk for not doing that probably is bigger um, in some ways than, than doing it. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I want to think about it a little more, but I think it's really an interesting approach. I absolutely agree. I think that brings up the broader point too, that, that you know, in the end, it's better to be fast than 100% accurate and, deta and have tons of details. Um, this is something that, that was mentioned by Michael Fiena in an article I tweeted out earlier about uh, the Joplin crisis, but it's that, you know, in general, in a crisis, yes, you need to be get real information that's credible that you've confirmed, but you also just have to be fast. And we saw that with Virginia Tech with the unfortunate fact that, you know, they had an initial, what they thought was simply a campus murder on campus, and they waited, you know, two hours, and they waited until something else happened to say something. So the question is, is it better safe than sorry? In general speaking, with safety, whether it's online crisis communication or not, I do say yes. So, you know, I think it is good to get out there as quickly as possible, uh, at, at all, at, not at all costs, but close to it. I think I, you don't want to be someone who held back because you wanted to get a little bit more info to add to that and then something happens because of it. So, now this is what we're talking about in the crisis. Oh, and actually, the one thing I want to say before we move on, uh, yeah, media relations, Twitter is huge. Uh, we found in our situations, as, as most folks know, I, I work at UCLA, I've been there through things like Michael Jackson, Britney Spears, lots of things it's always good to tell the media how they can get information from their mobile phones. And that's one cool thing with Twitter, is telling anybody, especially now that Twitter has fast follow, which means that you don't have to have a Twitter account to be able to follow a Twitter account. So you could tell the media or anyone else that's calling, I want more information, you can say, listen, text you know, UCLA Newsroom to 40404 and you will get all the updates today as they come out with links to our site with information. Um, that's something that the media has loved so they're not constantly calling us because what's happened obviously beforehand is information flow was, was coming back through the university, right? There's a crisis, people would call in, they'd want information, the media would call you and you'd tell them what's going on. Now you can reverse that and say that if you follow us on Twitter, you will get a text message with a link to every statement we put out today. Um, I think that's a really cool approach. I think media relations offices should be prepared to use Twitter in that capacity uh, in a crisis just to handle the media. I, at least I think that I found that itself uh, quite valuable. Um, but you know, moving on now to post-crisis. You know, this is this is what you're doing while everything's going on, um, and you're throughout the day putting up information and you're providing information to people. Um, but I think you know, post-crisis is just as important. Um, you know, so Colleen, from your experience, how do you go from day one crisis to day two? You know, what do you do the next day when things are sort of over, but you have to wrap it up somehow? I mean, what what do you what are some advice you'd give for post-crisis uh, situations? Well, I mean, I think at that point that. You know, once the immediate crisis is over, once the safety issue is over, once everyone is safe and healthy, the information is shared, um, I think that's when you do start to go back to your brand message. Um, and you do that by, you know, I think as we talked a little bit about, Seth, telling your own stories, um, deciding which, which stories to tell for your institution um, about what's just happened, how it's wrapping up what actions are still be, have been taken, are still being taken. Um, I think that's part of it where you can humanize it a little more. You're past the you know, active shooter on campus, everyone takes shelter, what have you. Um, and now you're really talking about you know, how to move forward. Um, and you're, again, making those individual personal connections with people and having that conversation um, as it's emerging online. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just can't agree more. The, the, the post crisis opportunity is a chance for you to tell your own story. Uh, example of that was, I think it was Kansas State, 2008, uh, was hit by tornado, and they did a great job of shooting video of cleanups and, and what they were doing, taking photos, and it wasn't a pretty story. It was a sad, tragic story. But the reality is they were a victim, and by telling their story, they built huge support with their audience, with alumni, members of the community, people that wanted to help. Uh, so, you know, 
that's one thing, depending on the, the type of crisis, don't be afraid to own the story. Even if it's a terrible situation like an active shooter, you have an opportunity to tell the story of what your campus police did do and working to keep the campus safe. It's a continued dialogue. You know, people, it's not a light switch for people. If there's a crisis, people are very afraid. They're scared. They're nervous. They want information. They really are relying on you. They don't turn the switch off the next day. I think that stuff kind of fades. And you can use that to build a longer relationship and really work through what happened, have conversations. And uh, I think that's good. Also, I think it's important personally to have both a public and private, you know, post-mortem meeting. I think you need to talk about what worked and what didn't, and also talk about what you're willing to acknowledge publicly didn't didn't work. I think that sometimes that's important to say, we know this happened this time, here's what we're gonna work to do you know, in the future about this. Um, again, because even if you're saying you're not gonna use Facebook, you need to tell people you're not gonna use Facebook. I can't stress enough, I think that's the wrong approach, but you need to tell people so they have an expectation. People have an expectation to have information instantly. That's the generation we live in today. So they're gonna expect that from you, uh, so make sure you find a way to give them. So. Again, I think the biggest thing for me post-crisis is, is finding a way to, to learn from your mistakes, prepare for the next one, and then publicly share your story. I think it's a lost opportunity for a lot of folks that leave it to the mainstream media or their, or their student paper to try and you know, tell the, the wrap-up piece of what really went down. No, I agree. And I think you said something really important there, Seth. Well, many things, actually. <laughs> um, but in particular, I think the fact that if something doesn't work, if your community feels like they weren't communicated with the way they want to be communicated with, and you're hearing that now through social media, through multiple channels, use and seize that opportunity to continue the conversation and turn it into a positive and be able to say, honestly, don't lie, um, not that anyone ever would, um, but honestly say, you know what, we hear you. And, you know, we really, you're important to us. Our safety is important. And here's how we're going to work in the future uh, to make sure that, X doesn't happen again, or to make sure that you are communicated with as quickly as you want to be. Um, and we'll keep you posted in this way. And you can learn more via this website or what have you. Um, so I think that that's a real opportunity there to turn something that may not be as positive as you would have liked um, into something really interesting. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, as we're talking about these crises, again, a lot of what shaped the conversation during today's show is talking about, you know, whether it's a crime on campus shooter or if it's a natural disaster. But I do want to take a second to say that when you're looking at your crisis communication plan, it should include web based crisis. There is I know it seems different, but a really bad viral video about your campus is a crisis and it should be approached in a similar light. Now, I know that safety is not always the same issue, but the safety of your brand is. So at least on the scale of communications on that level, it's really important to have a crisis communications plan in place for web-based crisis situations. I think that's something that's missed a lot, and that's why when a video goes out, people don't know how to respond, or it takes a really long time to get your president or your chancellor or your, pre or your, your VP to, to respond about it because he doesn't know how to respond to blog posts if they're really bad. This is kind of common, but again, I think there should be a plan in place uh, on ex what to do for web-only crisis situations because those are happening too. And that involves just monitoring the situation, understanding the differences and the nuances, and being prepared to respond quickly, obviously, in any crisis situation. Speed is really important. Yeah. And I think sometimes one of the most powerful things you can do in a web-based crisis situation when you're dealing with kind of negative feelings about your institution um, is reaching out to the person and simply saying, okay, talk to me, what's going on? Um, listening to what they have to say, responding to it in some way. Sometimes someone just wants to know they've been heard. Sometimes they want to know what actions are being taken. Sometimes it's helpful to be able to offer them, you know what, we hear you. We hear that you have bigger concerns. Here's a human being. Here's a vice president, an associate vice president, a dean, someone you can contact um, with your concerns, if it's something along those lines, too. Um, but sometimes just offering that information can really diffuse what can be a very tender subject. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So, you know, guys, this is um, kind of already bringing a little bit to a close the, the crisis communications conversation that we're having today. Um, but I want to just call in, give, give me some final takeaways as we see if there's any final questions coming in. You know, what are the main points that you want to make today that you want folks to be able to walk away with? You know, I think that the biggest things, again, are understand what a crisis means in today's environment. Make sure your institution understands what a crisis is, what the different types of crises are. Um, I think use that opportunity to really examine your processes um, and your tools. Make sure that you have your strategy in place, not just your technical tool, but how to use that tool effectively. Um, because without one, the other does not function. It has no reason. Um, I think make sure that you remember that you have certain goals in a crisis and you need to adhere to them. Um, 
you know, make sure that your information gets out quickly. Um, and then we always say survive, protect. First, your first and foremost issue is you need to survive this crisis. In some cases, that's a very literal survive. Um, remember that that's goal number one. Um, focus on whatever the issue is and making sure that you're, you're kind of messaging that correctly, you're getting the right information out. Focus on the immediate needs of the crisis and make sure they're being met. Flex as needed. Um, as people on Twitter and, and in the conversation stream here mentioned, um, Things will change. No crisis is going to adhere exactly to your plan. Um, so make sure you're flexing when necessary. Um, and then after you've survived, after you've gotten the information out quickly and efficiently, after you've kind of worked to make sure all the different needs are being met, then make sure that you're protecting your brand and your institution's basic kind of reputation by telling your own story um, and make sure that um, you're kind of sharing the impact of this crisis and what's going to happen next um, by telling your own story for your institution. Yeah, I, I think that is a whole load of information. That is some great tips and, and info. I, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, my, my thought too is the same thing. It's just, you know, be fast. Remember what's important, which is safety. Utilize what's available. And my big thing is be responsive. That's the thing when it comes to people saying we're not using Facebook or Twitter. If someone's on there and they're asking you what's going on, they care. Respond to them. Even if, again, your plan is we're going to just tell everybody homepage is the best place. Homepage, homepage is the best place. We're going to direct them there. That's fine. Um, but I just want to say that it's all about being responsive. It's about keeping people safe, being responsive. And uh, and then the last thing I'll say is this, guys. Just curious question. Again, uh, you know, prepare ahead of time and have a good plan. But think of all of the what ifs. Do you guys have a crisis communications uh, plan, a contact list right now, right? I mean, a lot of institutions have, you know, you'll have your emergency contact sheet. But what happens if those numbers are only cell phone numbers? What happens when cell service goes down in disaster? You know, what happens when you don't have internet in your office and that's where people are? What happens when it happens in the middle of the night and people can't travel except, you know, if there's no way to travel on the highways or the roads? These are the things that it's worth talking about. For all the things we go off in higher ed and have, you know, retreats about and, and get-togethers, there should be a time to sit down with the key core people and have every single part of these conversations and then disseminate that information to 100% of your staff. I believe crisis communications is something that is an all on board effort. Now, obviously not everyone has every piece of information, but everyone needs to understand what their role is. Even if their role is just to sit on their hands and stay put, that's still a role. And I think everyone needs to know. So I think it's really important to have these conversations. And um, my last thing I'll say is um, my, my personal opinion. We've heard a couple questions come in. Nick Denardis asked earlier, you know, what, what happens if you think there's a problem with the crisis communications plan or you think someone involved is not inappropriate in the role? This is a tough thing because you never want to say something to the rest of your, you know, your company, your institution, like, oh, I think we're doing this wrong. Uh, but we are talking about campus safety. You know, this is a really serious conversation. We're talking about you know, a nightmare scenario and how you're going to respond. So my, my personal opinion would be this. If you actually have a very real problem with the current crisis communications plan on your campus, Send an email about it and CC a couple people. We all know the power of emails, at least at public institutions. They're totally searchable by freedom of information requests. Don't be afraid to spark this conversation. Speak up a little bit and have it. I think that if people really hear you out, they'll understand that your heart is in the right place and it's not something to be upset about. That we all want to have the safest, smartest, fastest response in a crisis. So if you have something to add to that conversation, don't be afraid to go ahead and add it. Yeah, I think that it is one of the most crucial conversations we have as an institution. And I would agree in that it's one of the conversations none of us like to have. None mm -hmm. of us ever want to think about the fact that we are vulnerable to a crisis, yeah. um, whether that's an online crisis or you know a health and safety crisis or what have you. Um, so we really hate to have that conversation. We hate to have to examine it. We don't like as institutions to have to have those meetings and do the binder in the process because it means that we're vulnerable. Um, but I do agree, it is one of our primary responsibilities um, to make sure that as our students are learning, they are also safe in that learning environment. Um, so Seth, I can't say how much I agree with if you see an issue that you think needs resolved, um, then do send an email, do try to engage that conversation my one suggestion would be there, um, as you do send that email, as you do engage that conversation, 
I would recommend sharing a possible alternative. So um, as you're going forward, don't just say, I see this as a problem. Say, I see this as a problem, and here's one way we might be able to address it. So be proactive about it. I think that that's usually received a lot better um, because then you're really kind of adding to the conversation. So I think that can help. Absolutely. I think it was a really great point. So, you know, Colleen, again, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate you being a part of this. It's a conversation that, that as we both said, I think is really important. And I think we've hit on a lot of stuff. And uh, I don't know, we might have to bring you back on and do a round two at some point. I think it was a great conversation. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks a lot for having me. And thanks, everybody, for all the great information going on via Twitter. I'm sure we'll kind of be going through that and um, sharing resources. And I think it's, it's great stuff. We all have to do it. We all need to do it. Um, and I think that we can share some really great information to make sure we're all as safe and protected and ready to go um, if and when that crisis hits. Absolutely. All right. So thanks. My thanks to Colleen. Thanks to you guys for watching. Uh, as I said, this is Higher Ed Live, the live weekly web show all about the world of higher education. This is now the time when I usually plug our sponsors, but I'm going to pass on that because Ustream has apparently stolen my time to do so. <laughs> Let me say, sorry to everyone watching on Ustream that had to deal with the ads today. I am going to be handling this with Ustream. You may see us on a different platform come next week, but either way, tune into Higher Ed Live because we're here each and every week, what, whichever platform it might be. Next week, we're talking the newest round of Google Analytics, what's new with Seth Miranda. Very, very good conversation. And then we have a whole lot more coming up. Higher Ed Live is on the road. So find us in Albany, New York. Find us in Boston. Find us all over the place. And find us at higheredlive.com for all that information. So one last time, my thanks to Colleen. My thanks to you guys for watching. And uh, I will see you all next Sunday. Until then, please do take care.